good evening. Welcome to the AV 1611 hour. This is Pastor Nelson Turner coming to you live from central Pennsylvania in the United States of America. I want to welcome you to a live broadcast February 21st, the year of our Lord, 2004, Saturday evening, 7 p.m. This broadcast, as always, is dedicated to the King James Bible, the Word of God in the English language. This evening, I'm going to move rapidly into the subject for tonight. We'll be start with a verse of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that verse describes the ministry, or part of the ministry of every Bible-believing preacher that ever lived. That's supposed to be part of the ministry of all Bible-believing preachers is to reprove, to expose the unfruitful works of darkness, to shine the light of God's Word upon them, and to bring the iniquities, the transgressions, and the sins of both religious transgressors and others to the light of day. And that's what we're going to do here this evening on the AV 1611 hour. And first, we're going to start with um, a little statement and then to prepare you for what's to come, I'll read one or two other little um, quotes and citations. But Catholicism is an interesting religion. It's the religion that gave the world Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, Torquemada, the Inquisitional Torturer, Napoleon, the European French Conqueror, Leo the Great, the Pope that set up and codified uh, the papacy at the beginning of its present form. Charles II, that vicious, dirty, drunken, whoremongering, bastard-creating, filthy wretch that inhabited the throne of England for well over 25 years, and upon his deathbed took Roman Catholic confirmation and communion. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, all of its... Uh, Members of the mafia in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s were good Roman Catholics, except for one or two Jews. The rest of them were all Roman Catholics, whether they were Irishmen like O'Banion or Lucky Luciano and Paul Castellano, people like that, Italians. They were all Catholics. Mother Teresa, a Catholic. Mussolini, a Catholic. Hitler, a Catholic. The Jesuit-inspired... Man Himmler, the, not the mastermind, but one of the tools used by the Jesuits to commit the atrocities that occurred in the 40s in Europe. Fidel Castro, another good Jesuit-trained tool. Bloody Mary. The Crusades. Joan of Arc. The Thirty Years' War. The Inquisition. World War I. World War II. The Vietnam War. And the Holocaust. The church that gave us all these wonderful personalities and all these wonderful events, including, of course, the assassination of our former president, past president, John F. Kennedy, is now presenting us with her latest faithful son here in America, Mel Gibson, the Jesuit coadjutor, and his Catholic extravaganza, The Passion of Christ. This evening, we're going to detail the facts that are very transparent to those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, concerning what the purpose of this movie is. Now, I have before me a couple of publications and um, some other information as well that we're going to get into, but the celebrity news magazine called Star, January 27, 2004, had a four-page spread in the center of the magazine, the tabloid, on Mel Gibson and his biggest passion. And it listed him in there as a traditionalist Catholic who does not acknowledge the authority of the Vatican. That's a quote, and that's from the center portion of the story. They label him as a traditionalist Catholic who does not acknowledge the authority of the Vatican. One cannot be a Catholic without acknowledging the authority of the Vatican. And if he is a Catholic who does not acknowledge the authority of the Vatican, why is it that when he was in Rome last February... Mel and his family, when they visited Rome, they were led on a tour of churches by a priest. If he's a Catholic in rebellion against the Pope and does not acknowledge the authority of the Pope, what is he doing in the Pope's city, over which he rules temporally, Rome, 
being guided around by one of the Pope's priests to Catholic churches. Don't believe this line. This is nothing but a uh, lie from the pit of hell. Uh, they have a picture of Mel outside the family church in Malibu, Malibu, California, that he um, paid $2.8 million to build. That's where they say masses in Latin. Now, knowing the furor that's been already raised concerning this movie, knowing the violence that this movie is going to portray against supposedly the person of our Lord Jesus, and of course the Jesus that's pictured in Mel's movie as a typical blue-eyed, long-haired Catholic Christ, has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible. The Bible's very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, or excuse me, 11, 1 Corinthians 11, in your King James, A.B. 1611, Sword of the Spirit Reformation Bible, that it is a shame unto a man if he has long hair. Nature teaches that. So according to these Catholics, the Lord Jesus himself, being God manifest in the flesh, did something that was shameful according to the King James Bible. Well, we know he didn't. He didn't have long hair. But they portrayed him with long hair. Now, it's very interesting to me that in the Newsweek from February 16th, that's last week, there's a long article and a cover story dedicated to Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. It's a story by John Meacham. The cover of Newsweek has a picture of this Catholic Christ, all bloodied with a crown of thorns on his head. And it says, Who killed Jesus? What history teaches us? Now, if you've listened to the AB 1611 broadcast here on WWRB regularly, you know that I've dealt with the man named Tex Mars, the power of prophecy writer and supposed New Age exposer, and I've exposed him for being a Jesuit coadjutor. Now we have our proof from the two men together. Tex Mars last August did a tape who killed Jesus? And he blamed it squarely on the Jew. Now here, seven months later or so, six months later, we have on the cover of Newsweek, who really killed Jesus? It seems to me that Tex and Mel have gotten their script from the same source, the same rotten, putrid source. And of course, Tex Mars blames the Jews for killing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, Mel Gibson, when confronted on that, answered very plainly that they were the uh, physical agents of his demise. But in this article, Newsweek, page 51, concerning the Passion, I'm going to quote, If pointing to a 40-year-old church teaching is not enough, we can also look back more than 400 years to find the seeds of reconciliation and grace. At the Council of Trent in the 16th century, the Roman Church stated as a theological principle that all men share the responsibility for the Passion and that all Christians bear a particular burden. Quotes, In this guilt for the death of Jesus are involved all those who frequently fall into sin, read the Catechism of the Council. This guilt seems more enormous in us than in the Jews, since if they had not known it, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. While we, on the contrary, professing to know him, Yet denying him by our actions seem in some sort to lay violent hands on him. The Council of Trent, according to Newsweek, page 51, where they quote the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent said that they profess to know him but deny him by their actions. <laughs> That's from Newsweek, last week's issue. Uh, in any case, this writer of this article made a very grievous mistake when he attempted to point out that the Council of Trent made conciliatory moves toward the Jews. They did nothing of the sort. Now, I have before me, of course, a copy, not in totality, but a good bit of it I printed out of my computer of the printing of the decrees of the Council of Trent from the various sessions. And in a moment, we're going to go through these decrees. Now, first, we want to establish that Mel Gibson... Uh, does not adhere to the Vatican II ecumenical-type council that was held in 1963. And we're going to prove that from his own words. I'm not a big TV watcher, and basically I'm not a TV watcher at all. But because his interview with Diane Sawyer, the CFR member, who two years ago chortled when she presented the Jewish family, the Jacobses, 
who were having microchips implanted into their arms and laughed and said, maybe some of you will be getting these soon. Ha ha ha. Old Diane Sawyer, the CFR member, um, she interviewed Gibson. And she spoke of, quote, Mel Gibson, well, here it is, a quote, reborn spirituality, end quote, of Mel Gibson. And then Gibson said that Jack Nicholson said, how's Jesus treating you? Ha, 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 like that was a joke. And then Mel Gibson said he himself is a mix of Howard Stern and St. Francis Assisi. Ugh. And he said, quote, I think the Holy Ghost is real. Now, that's the profession of a man that's lost and on his way to hell. Mel Gibson... You're, on, you're lost and on your way to hell. You don't have Christ. You don't know the Lord's Christ. Any man that thinks the Holy Ghost is real is on their way to hell. I know the Holy Ghost is real because he's inside of me. See, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And all the saints of God know the movings and motions and directions and leadings of the very spirit of the living God. Now, Mel said, quotes, God ordains everything, quotes, nothing happens by chance. Then he said, quote, I did it with God's help. Now, since the Roman Catholics do not address our Heavenly Father as Holy Father, but rather call the Pope Holy Father, I can only conclude that no matter what the press may say about Mel acknowledging the Pope's authority or not, since he said he did it with God's help, and Holy Father is a title in the Bible delegated to God the Father alone by the Lord Jesus Christ in John 17, that Mel must have done this with the Pope's help. Diane Sawyer said Abe Foxman slipped in uninvited to see the viewing. Well, Abe Foxman is a traitor to the Jewish people and a agitator, an agitator to raise up a furor and give an object of hatred to the Gentile peoples of America. He didn't sneak in. You, you're you kidding me? A closed screening, and he snuck in. Uh-huh. Um, now, Mel Gibson, when questioned about his relationship or feelings about the Jews, said that they were the material agents of the Lord Jesus Christ's demise. Well, he said the material agents of his demise, meaning the Sanhedrin and the followers of the Sanhedrin and the Romans. When Diane Sawyer point-blank asked him, you're not an anti-Semite, are you? He said, no, of course not. Uh-huh. Well, all Jesuits have a rule called mental reservation. It's okay to lie with your mouth as long as you tell yourself the truth in your mind and heart. Now, again, uh, he said that anti-Semitism is condemned by papal encyclicals. That's news to me. Um, in fact, during all of World War II, and I've studied this in depth, Pope Pius XII never once denounced the destruction of the Jewish people until until it was obvious that the war was going to be won by the Western Allies. Then he cast in his lot with them by some very feeble speaking, but never standing up for the Jews one time, even though he has the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, the best espionage and uh, intelligence network gathering system in the world. And, of course, currently virtually all of the world's Intelligence agencies are infiltrated or controlled by Jesuits. Now, to be anti-Semitic is unchristian, according to Mel Gibson. Well, I guess Pope Pius XII was unchristian. Um, Mel Gibson said, I wanted to push the viewer over the edge. See, in the doublespeak of Roman Catholic temporal Jesuit coadjutors, you can find glimpses of the truth here and there. He wanted to push the viewer over the edge. Over the edge of what? Over the edge to where? Um, Mel Gibson, according to this interview, carries a church relic from Ann Emmerich. So he's a superstitious sort of fellow that believes that, that bits of bone and splinters of the cross or maybe the foreskin of baby Jesus or droplets of his blood held in chalices and reliquaries all over Europe are to be venerated. Now, this is not a Christian man. A Christian man would never say, quotes, I'm quoting him. It's printed in the Star magazine from January 27, 2004, but he said it on TV. We are all children of God, all of us. We're all children of God. He said that twice. So he called Jesus Christ a liar by that statement. 
You see, Jesus Christ said that there were men that were not children of God on the earth. And by saying we're all children of God, of course, that would mean that Hitler was, Turkomeda was, Ignatius Loyola was, Himmler was, <laughs> Klaus Barbie was, and all the rest of them. See, uh, by saying that we're all children of God, Mel Gibson shows that he's of his father, the devil. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. So again, he said, Mel Gibson said, I've done a lot of things I'm not proud of. Every person has. This is his conversion experience, I guess. He said, I hit my knees and said, help. Uh-huh. He said, quote, here's a key to what's going on and what's going to happen in America. Pain is the precursor to change. A direct quote from the interview of Mel Gibson with Diane Sawyer. Quotes, pain is the precursor to change. The pain of whom? He didn't say. Then he said this, do you believe this, my dear Christian Bible-believing friend? Look, you should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. If a man says that all people are the children of God, he's engaged in an unfruitful work of darkness, and he needs to be exposed. If a man says that a soul can get to heaven without knowing Jesus Christ personally, without having faith to come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, he's a liar. Mel Gibson said, quotes, It is possible for people who are not even Christian to get into the kingdom of heaven. End quote. Uh-huh. That's what he said. Is that the speech of a regenerated man? I trow not. Then, the last two statements I'm going to read of Mel Gibson from that interview, which I took notes on. He said, quotes, I'm just a Roman Catholic the way they were up until the mid-60s. Now we're going to delineate what Roman Catholics were up until the mid-60s. He's telling us what he is. And when asked about the Jewish thing again, he said, quotes, let's get the Bible and the Talmud out together. That's the speech of a Jesuit. That's how they talk. A Jesuit or a Jesuit coadjutor, or if nothing else, one who is in subservience to and under the influence of Jesuits. The Jesuits have two primary enemies. The Society of Jesus regard the Jewish people as their mortal enemies, and regard the Jewish people as so filled with iniquity, so iniquitous, so barbarous, and so filled with a loathsome disease that they must be extirpated from off the face of the earth. Now, I'm going to read you the absolutist principles, the absolutist maxims of the Jesuits. I'm going to read them to you. This is from a book called The Jesuits' Catechism, According to Loyola. Published in London, 1685, by John Lawrence Publishers. Here they are. Number one, there is but one supreme authority in the world, and that is the Pope. Number two, God hath delivered over unto the Pope the power and rule of heaven and earth. Therefore, we must be obedient unto him upon pain of damnation. Number three, all right and power are lodged in his breast. Number four, no law can be made to bind Christians, but by the Pope's authority. As of old, the Israelites received none but Moses. Number five, the gospel would not be the gospel if the Pope had not approved of it. This is what traditionalist Roman Catholics and Jesuits believe. Traditionalist pre-Vatican II Catholics adhere to the Council of Trent. And like I said, I have a copy before me. And I'm going to read you sections of that. So you can hear for yourself what Mel Gibson's profession of faith is and undoubtedly what many other supposed Protestant ministers, shortwave radio host, confession of faith is. I'm challenging all of you, virtually all of you, almost all of you are a bunch of cowards. You're under the sway of the Pope of Rome. You have no backbone, no spine to resist, no righteousness, no faith in Jesus Christ. That's right, most of you don't. And I'm talking about all you big boys, all you patriot boys. And, of course, this includes Alex Jones. Last week, Alex Jones engaged in a full hour of apologetics for the Church of Rome with Hutton Gibson, Mel's 85-year-old father. I heard the interview. And they talked about how the Freemasons took over the Vatican and the Church of Rome in the late 50s. Well, they didn't tell you that the Jesuits control the Freemasons. That's right, the Jesuits control the Freemasons. They didn't tell you that according to the Freemasonic literature itself, 
as I've oft repeated, that in 1732, in the College of Claremont, the Jesuit College in France, Chevalier de Bonville came up and cooked up the first 25 orders of the ancient and accepted rite of Scottish Freemasonry. And these things were taken in 1801 to Charleston, South Carolina, and then promulgated by the influence and uh, work of Albert Pike. Got the proof. Got the proof right out of the Freemasons' book. They said that is the best account of the founding of the orders of Freemasonry. So the Freemasons, without a doubt, are under the control of, guess who? The Jesuits, the Catholic Pope. And by the way, Thomas Watson, the head of international business machines in the early part of the 20th century and during World War II, who gave the Germans the equipment to track and take the censuses and look out and find out where the Jews were, down to one sixteenth of a bloodline of a Jew, he was not only a Knight of Malta and a Roman Catholic, but I have before me <laughs> a little pamphlet published by the Freemasons. And don't let anybody tell you that a Freemason can't be a Catholic and a Catholic can't be a Freemason. Thomas J. Watson is listed in this pamphlet on the back where it says the pamphlet is who are the Masons and what do they are they and what do they do? Thomas J. Watson is listed as a Freemason, even though he was a Catholic and a Knight of Malta. Harry Truman's listed. George Washington's listed, but he was a 32nd degree Freemason. He was not involved in illuminated Freemasonry, to my knowledge. John Wayne is listed. Plenty of other of your big stars. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sad to see, including Roy Acuff, one of my favorite gospel singers from the 40s. Um, isn't it interesting? But uh, I don't have time to go into all that. There's a bunch of Catholics listed here. And, of course, these Catholics in this list happen to be Freemasons and are claimed by the Freemasons. So Thomas Watson, who met Hitler in a closed room in 1937 face-to-face -face and received the Order of the German Cross, I believe, from Thomas Watson. I know he received an order. I'm not sure about the exact order. I can't remember that right off the top of my head exactly. But he received a decoration from Hitler and spoke to Hitler in private in 1937 and supplied the Reich with the machinery, the tabulating machinery necessary to pull off the relocations and exterminations. Of course, this was all done under the auspices of the Archbishop or the Cardinal in New York at the time. But to continue on with these absolutist papal maxims of the Jesuits, um, the gospel would not be the gospel if the Pope had not approved of it. The Pope can take away any man's right and give it to another. The Pope can do anything above all right, against all right, and without all right. If Christ command one thing and the Pope another thing, the Pope is rather to be obeyed than Jesus Christ. This is traditionalist Catholic doctrine. The Pope's decoratory letters are to be received and esteemed as authentic as the Word of God or the Holy Scriptures. It is sacrilege to question the Pope's actions, and he is cursed of God who violates the Pope's censures. According to traditionalist Catholic viewpoint, I'm a cursed of God just for reading this to you. Um, if the Pope affirms that to be black, which our eyes judge to be white, we ought also then to declare that it's black upon pain of our souls. The Pope hath the sole rule and power of the whole world in temporals as well as in spirituals, and therefore can depose emperors and kings and may dispose of their dominions as he, as he shall think convenient. If the Pope shall depose a king and give his kingdom to another, and the people will not receive him, the Pope may bring him in by force of arms, because he is judge of all, and instead of God on the earth. Not to be believed, not to believe that the Pope can depose kings is to be, and that deservedly, damned for heresy. Christ had not done wisely if he had not left the Pope power to dispose kings. If a king be a heretic or a favor of a heresy, he may be deposed such as John Fitzgerald Kennedy. If the Pope shall declare a king to be a heretic, he hath no right to his kingdom, and the Pope may depose him. The Pope can give the people liberty either to choose or to take new masters. By this means, they keep all kings and princes in their obedience and submission to the Pope. Get point 19 and get it good. All Protestants are heretics, and therefore they ought to be killed. And get this and get it good, you Christians that think the Jews are your big enemy. I'm telling you who your enemy is. And let me tell you something else. 
If you go to see Mel Gibson's movie and you plunk down the 15 or 20 bucks or whatever it is, you're supporting someone who's promoting your own dis extermination. It's the same thing when you buy videos and tapes from people like Alex Jones and Tex Mars. You're promoting one and helping one who is setting you up to be destroyed here in this remnant of white Calvinistic Bible-believing civilization that was established by white Bible-believing Protestants in defiance of papal Rome. You're funding your own destruction when you support these people. They said all Protestants are heretics and therefore ought to be killed. That doesn't line up with what Mel said that we're all children of God, does it? And lastly, point 20, it is better and safer to make alliance and amity with Turks, infidels, or Jews than with heretic Protestants because they may draw us into their errors or their novelties. In other words, a Bible-believing Calvinist Protestant is the most dangerous man in the world to the Jesuits and the papacy and is at all costs to be extirpated and destroyed. Now, gotten that said, and having that done here at the AB 1611 hour, I want to give you an identification. My name is N.C. Turner, and it's uh, February 21st, 2004, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States of America. If you want to write the AB 1611 hour, you can. And I'm going to notify you as well that Vatican Assassins II, the second edition of Eric John Phelps' Vatican Assassins I, has now been completed. And in a future broadcast, I'm going to let you know how you can get your own copy of Vatican Assassins II, which is expanded and revised with uh, many additional photographs and corrections, emendations and such. I'm going to let you know how you can get that. It will be only on CD-ROM offered by the author himself. But I won't do that tonight. What I'm going to do tonight is just let you know how you can contact me. AV 1611 hour, P.O. Box 184, Grantville, G-R-A-N-T-V-I-L-O-E, P.A. Zip 17028. That's AB 1611 hour. P.O. Box 184, Grantville, P.A. Zip 17028. I will attempt to give you that identification later on the broadcast. Um, I'm going to warn you people, listening to my voice right now, whether you be Catholic, Jew, Protestant, lost or saved. One more time, I've been preaching this for years, I'm going to say it again. There's a horrible bloodbath coming in the United States of America. And you have to do the best you can to get out of the way. And particularly... If you are a Calvinistic, Bible-believing Protestant, or if you are a person of Jewish extraction, whether you're saved or lost, whether you're saved or lost, listen closely, you better get out of here. Because I found from my correspondence with various listeners spread all across a good part of the United States, all the way to Colorado, that the people that do know what's going on and have dropped out of, quotes, have dropped out of the system, have no ability and no power to really influence anybody else. They're holed up somewhere, up in the valleys, in the mountains, down in the plains, all alone, or with their wife, maybe a child or two. And they have no ability to be able to influence other people and come together with other people to do anything to stop what's going to happen. You see, anybody that works with the Catholic Church for the Catholic Church, who were even acknowledged that a Catholic is a Christian, is part of the problem, not part of the solution. This is why I tell you point blank, Alex Jones, you're part of the problem. We know who you're working for, and we know how you got in Bohemian Grove. You expect us to believe that you crawled in there and nobody else could ever get in there for years? Buddy, you don't fool us. You walked around in there and they didn't know who you were? Come on, man. They let you in. And that's just the way it is. And any man that promotes the overall idea and presumption that a nation that's not righteous can do right and stave off their own doom is a fool. And the reason 
all these patriot agitators are doomed to fail is because they're unrighteous. I know that from personal information. They're unrighteous. They're wicked. They claim to be outside the system, but they'll take people into courts of laws and roll them over. That's right. They won't touch the Jesuits with a 10-foot stick. They won't spit on a piece of paper that has the word Jesuit printed on it. Why is that? Why are they blaming Jews and Freemasons? And then why do they say all Jews are communists? Well, that's the standard party line of the Vatican. But now we're going to go to the Council of Trent. First, I want to read the definition of what an anathema is, so that when I read that word in this discourse, the Council of Trent dis discourse, you'll know what an anathema is. It's essentially an excommunication with curses. So when I say, let him be anathema, as I quote the Council of Trent from the various sessions, you'll understand and know that the Council of Trent has cursed everyone who disagrees with their position or won't go along with it. Okay, here we go. And this is coming from a book printed in the 1500s, which had commentary of John Calvin on the various decrees of the Council of Trent. This is a first decree of the fourth session of the Council of Trent held April 8, 1546. In the first part of that, they declared that the books of Tobit, Judith, the Book of Wisdom, Ecclesiastes, Baruch, and First and Second Maccabees were canon. Uh, they put the Apocrypha mixed in to the Old Testament with the inspired authors. They declared the Apocrypha to be given by inspiration of God. Not only did they do that, that was in their first decree, but in the second decree of the fourth session of the Council of Trent, April 8, 1546, they said that they approved and declared that the ancient Vulgate edition, approved by its long use for so many centuries in the church itself, be held in authentic and public lectures, debates, sermons, and expositions, and that no man is to dare or presume on any pretext to reject it. Besides, in order to curb petulant minds, the council decrees that no man trusting in, to his own wisdom in matters of faith and discipline pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, twisting the sacred scripture to his own sense, dare to interpret the Holy Scripture contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church, to whom it belongs to judge of the true sense interpretation of the Holy Scripture, has held or holds, or even contrary to the unanimous consent, unanimous consent of the fathers, even though these interpretations are never to be published. Let those who contravene be denounced by the ordinaries and punished with the pains appointed by law. What does that mean? That means you can't read your King James Bible or any other Bible, and come to your own conclusions about what you should do according to the Word of God. That you're only supposed to trust their interpretation or what they tell you, and that anybody that doesn't do that is to be denounced by the ordinaries, that's by the uh, prelates, and punished with the pains appointed by law. They also said, moreover, wishing to repress the temerity by which the words of Holy Scripture are turned and twisted to all kinds of profanity, the council commands and ordains in order to put an end to such irreverence and contempt and prevent anyone from daring in future in any way to use the words of Scripture for these or similar purposes. That's uh, the purposes that they said that Protestants use the Bible for. That all persons of this description, all corruptors and violators of the Word of God shall be coerced by their bishops by legal and discretionary punishment. In other words, if you, such as Tyndale or Wycliffe <laughs> or Luther, dare dare to translate the scriptures from Greek or Hebrew into your own language in the time when this was written, you're to be dealt with. Now, from the sixth session, further down, we're going to read a good bit, because now we get into the matters of justification by faith. These are the canons of the sixth session of the Council of Trent, 1546. The fourth canon. Whosoever shall say that the free will of man, moved and excited by God, does not at all cooperate with God when exciting and calling, that thus he may dispose and prepare himself for the obtaining the grace of justification, and that he cannot dissent though he wills it, but like something inanimate does nothing at all, and acts passively merely, let him be anathema. They pronounce an anathema upon every Calvinist right there. Because the Bible teaches and Calvinists believe that we are dead in sins and transgressions, and except God quicken us and raise us up to walk in newness of life, 
all through his volition, all through his will. Since we believe that, we're cursed. Again, they say, point five, whosoever shall say that the free will of man has lost, was lost and extinguished after Adam's sin, or that it is a thing of name merely, or a name without a thing, in short, a figment introduced into the church by Satan, let him be anathema. If you believe that sinners have no free will to receive Christ unless it's God's will for them to receive Christ and he reveal himself to them, the Pope has pronounced a curse on you. And Mel Gibson agrees, being a traditional Catholic, that if you're a Calvinist, you're a curse of God and that you're a heretic and you need to be dealt with. Uh, point seven, whosoever shall say that all the works which are done before justification, on whatever account they may be done, are truly sins and deserve the hatred of God, or that the more vehemently a man tries to dispose himself for grace, the more grievously he sins, let him be anathema. Whosoever, this is point eight, whosoever shall say that the fear of hell, by which we flee to the mercy of God, grieving for our sins, or by which we abstain from sinning, is sin, or makes sinners worse, let him be anathema. Point nine, whosoever shall say that the wicked is justified by faith alone, in such a sense that nothing else is required in the way of cooperation to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is in no respect necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. Point 11. Whosoever shall say that men are justified by the mere imputation of Christ's righteousness or by the mere remission of sins, exclusive of grace and charity, which is shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and is inherent in them, or also that by grace, which, that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. The Council of Trent, in its totality, is a complete denial of the truth contained in the Bible as it's written in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we see that the Council of Trent lays out the doctrine of the modern Arminian very clear. The Council of Trent lays out very plainly that all men have an ability and co-labor in salvation with Christ. So therefore, Jesus Christ alone is not the author and finisher of the faith that saves, but rather Christ is only a participator in the salvation of men, and men must participate with Christ to be saved. That's the infallible ex cathedra statements of the Council of Trent as ratified by the popes. And this is traditionalist Catholicism. This is what Mel Gibson believes. Point 12. Now, if you're a saved, born-again man, why would you have anything to do in promulgating, supporting, giving money or aid to anybody that believes these kind of things. Why would you buy the videotapes of a man like, like Alex Jones who supports people like Hutton Gibson and promotes people like Hutton Gibson and said point blank on his radio broadcast that he was going to go to the Passion as soon as it came out and he was going to support and promote the movie. A Roman Catholic extravaganza to help pave the way emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, and mentally, solically, for a holocaust, a repetition of what occurred during the 30s and 40s in Germany. Look, let me explain to you one more time, friend. The commandants of Buchenwald, of Dachau, of Majanic, of Bergen-Belsen, of Auschwitz, of Treblinka, of Sobibor, and all the rest of the camps were all catechized, baptized communicants in the Romish church. The actions, the words of both Hitler and Himmler had the complete approval of the Jesuit general and Pope Pius II, or the 12th, excuse me, Pope Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli. And uh, they believed that the, and this was the cover story provided by the Jesuits, that they were going to make the world safe from Bolshevism, Jewish Bolshevism or Jewish communism. 
uh, communism, as Brother Phelps elucidated a few weeks ago, was perfected on the Jesuit reductions in Paraguay and Uruguay down in South America back in the 16 and 1700s. Point 12 of the sixth session of the Council of Trent. Whosoever shall say that justifying faith is nothing else than trust in the divine mercy, forgiving sins by Christ, or that this trust is the only thing by which we are justified, let him be anathema. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That's what the Bible says. But if you believe you're saved by grace through faith alone, plus nothing, and if you believe with the believers in divine writ, the King James Bible, that the just shall live by faith, and that as back 2.4 says, the just shall live by his faith, the just one being Jesus Christ. And if you believe that Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, according to Hebrews 12.2, well, then you're cursed. You're cursed with a curse. And any traditionalist, tridentine, pre-1963 Catholic believer, of necessity must believe in all of the decrees of the Council of Trent. So, Mr. Gibson and his daddy believe that anybody that believes they're justified by faith alone and nothing else is cursed. Well, if you're under the curse, you can't possibly be the child of God, right? Uh, point 13, the Council of Trent, 1546. Whosoever shall... Now look, look, friends. Why is it that some little dirtbag like me, saved by grace through faith, a little whips of nothing, saved by the grace of God, has got to get on here and inform you of this, but none of these patriots and none of these other preachers are going to do it? Why? Yeah, point 13. Whosoever shall say that for any man to obtain the remission of sins, it is necessary to believe for his certainty and without any hesitancy as to his own weakness and disinclination that his sins are forgiven, let him be anathema. If you believe the doctrine of depravity, and if you understand that the doctrine of depravity teaches man's inability to come to Christ, and that except Christ give the ability, or except God the Father give the ability to the sinner, the sinner cannot come. And if you believe that you're justified by faith alone, by sheerly and plainly and simply having a faith, the faith of Jesus Christ in you, and that being turned towards Him alone as your Savior, you're accursed, according to pre-1963 traditional Romanism. Again, I'm going to read point 13. Whosoever shall say that for any man to obtain the remission of sins, it is necessary to believe for a certainty and without any hesitancy as to his own weakness and inclination that his sins are forgiven, let him be anathema. Point 14. Whosoever shall say that a man is absolved from his sins or justified by the mere circumstance of believing for a certainty that he is absolved or justified, or that no man is truly justified save he who believes that he is justified, and that acquittal and absolution are accompanied by faith alone, let him be anathema. Every one of you born-again Bible believers have been placed under a curse. And according to Jesuit maxims and papal doctrine are worthy to be exterminated because you are the enemies of the Pope. Point 15. Whosoever shall say that a man regenerated or justified is bound in faith to believe that he is certainly in the number of the predestinated, let him be anathema. If you're saved and you know that you've been predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, you're accursed. You're to be dealt with. Point 17, whosoever shall say that the grace of justification falls to none but those predestinated unto life, and that all others who are called are called indeed but do not receive grace as being predestinated by the divine power to evil, let him be anathema. If you believe in election and reprobation, you're accursed and you ought to be killed, according to the Council of Trent, because you're in rebellion against their Holy Father, the Pope of Rome. And by the way... I'm going to give you my address again. It's quarter to eight. I have these sheets printed out I'm reading off of. If you'd like these, I'll send them to you. You can write me at the AV 1611 hour, P.O. Box 184, Grantville, P.A., Zip 17028. That's AV 1611 hour, P.O. Box 184, Grantville, P.A., Zip 17028. 
I'll send you these eight or ten sheets I printed out, and you can read these things for yourself, straight from the Council of Trent, printed right from the original sources. Whosoever shall say that the grace of justification falls to none but those predestinated unto life, and that all others who are called are called indeed, but do not receive grace as being predestinated by the divine power to evil, let him be anathema. If you're not a free willer, you're under the curse of Rome. And if you don't believe that any man anywhere can get saved, and then if he works real hard and gets some prayers to pray him out of purgatory after he's dead, you're under the curse of the Council of Trent. And this is the faith of Mel and Hutton Gibson. And I believe, personally, that all those that are working with them, this is their faith as well, but they have this faith in the closet and not in public. They're crypto-Catholics and pseudo-Protestants. <laughs> Point 18, the Council of Trent, April 8, 1546. Whosoever shall say that the commandments of God are impossible of observance, even to a justified man and to one constituted under grace, let him be anathema. What does this point, point 18 of the Council of Trent, show? It shows that every one of you Yahweh law keepers are under the influence of the whore of Rome. That's right. And here in the Council of Trent, in just a minute, we're going to show you, by God's grace, reading from this, that Rome acknowledges that she is the whore of Revelation 17 in her own decrees. Point 19 of the Council of Trent. Whosoever shall say that nothing is commanded in the gospel except faith, that the other things are indifferent, being neither commanded nor prohibited, but free, or that the Ten Commandments do not apply to Christians, let him be anathema. Mm -hmm. Hey, brother, you Ten Commandment keeper, wherever you are out there, uh, you're working for the Pope and you don't know it. Point 20. Whosoever shall say that a justified man, however perfect, is not bound to the observance of the commandments of God and the church, but only to believe as if the gospel were a naked and absolute promise of eternal life, Without the condition of observing the commandments, let him be anathema. They just pronounced an anathema on Jesus Christ himself there, because Jesus Christ said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have life everlasting. The council of Trent placed a curse on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. These aren't my brethren, are they yours? Point 22 of the council of Trent. Whosoever shall say that a justified man even without the special assistance of God, is able to persevere and receive righteousness, or with the assistance of God is not able, let him be accursed. Point 24. Whosoever shall say that received righteousness is not preserved and even is not increased in the view of God by good works, that works themselves are only the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of increasing it, let him be anathema. Let's see, um, point 32. Whosoever shall say that the good works of a justified man are in such a sense the gifts of God, that they are not good merits of the justified man himself, or that a justified man by good works, which are done by him through the grace of God and the merits of Jesus Christ, of which he is a living member, does not truly merit increase of grace, eternal life, and the actual attainment of eternal life if he die in grace, together with increase of glory, let him be anathema. In other words... If you don't believe that good works secure or aid to receive salvation eternally, you're cursed. And if you say with the saints over in Isaiah, Thou hast also wrought all our works in us, Isaiah 26, you're cursed. If you're a Bible believer, you're cursed. And if you're a follower of the Catholicism of pre Vatican Council II, 1963, and you are, as Mel Gibson is, a traditionalist Catholic, you believe that every Protestant is a heretic and is under a curse and needs to repent of trusting Christ and believing the Bible and believing that a man is justified by faith through grace alone. You need to repent, get your heart right with the Pope, or you ought to be dealt with. That's what they all believe. Whosoever shall say that this Catholic doctrine of justification expressed by the Holy Council in this present decree derogates in any respect from the glory of God or the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ and does not rather illustrate the truth of our faith. In short, the glory of God and of Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. That was point 33. 33, as in 33rd degree Freemasonry. The 33rd point there 
said out of the sixth session that anyone that disagrees with that, them, and what they've said is accursed. If you don't, according to the seventh, sound, seventh session of the Council of Trent, if you don't believe that the sacraments, and they list them, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, penance, penance extreme unction, orders of matrimony, are truly sacraments and properly sacraments, you're accursed. Every one of you Bible-believing Christians who's born again, you're under the curse of the Pope of Rome. Even though you may be blessed of God, you're under the curse of the Pope. He's no Christian. He's a dirty, filthy murderer. He's a liar, and he's of his father, the devil. And the lust of his father, he will do. Well, I'm going to read you from the seventh session of baptism, and under that heading, point three. Whosoever shall say that in the Roman church, parentheses, which is the mother and mistress of all churches, there is not the true doctrine of the sacrament of baptism, let him be anathema. There the reverend fathers... In the Council of Trent, with the Jesuit order up and coming and buzzing about, proclaimed the Roman church to be the mother and mistress of all churches. <laughs> Go read Revelation 17 and line it up with that statement. Point five of baptism. Whosoever shall say that baptism is free, i.e. not necessary to salvation, let him be anathema. There are no deathbed conversions in the Roman Catholic Church. If you're sick and dying and God has chose to reveal his son in you ten minutes before your death, you can't go to heaven unless you have some Romish priest sprinkle you with that phony holy water. Whosoever shall say that a baptized person cannot lose grace, even though he will it, how much soever he may sin, if he be not unwilling to believe, let him be anathema. If you believe that a man is saved by faith alone... You're under the curse of the Romish church. You're an enemy of the society of Jesus. And you are in violation of canon law, and you must be dealt with. This is the teaching of the Council of Trent, and this is the belief of every single follower of pre-1963 Roman Catholicism. See, when it said that Mel or Hutton Gibson or anybody else is a traditionalist Catholic. They don't explain to you what a traditionalist Catholic is. Well, I just did. Now I'm going to read a quote or two from Vatican Assassins. Again, you can write me. AV 1611 hour, P.O. Box 184, Grantville, P.A. Zip 17028. We're going to read you two quotes. Actually, I think I'm only going to read you one quote from... Windeck Tanner Eberman, German Jesuit preaching the Thirty Years' War, quotes, For what object have we given to us money, soldiers, sabers, and cannon, but to use them against the enemy? Why do we hesitate then in commencing to eradicate and root out heresy, root and branch, and especially this Calvinist abomination? Kill them then! The hounds, strike them down and hurl them to the ground. Give them their finishing stroke. Burn their houses over their heads and overwhelm them with everything of the worst description that can be invented so that the hateful brood may finally disappear from off the face of the earth. Yep. That's what the Jesuits are all about. Now you know what a traditionalist Catholic is. Now you know what the Council of Trent in part stated. And what is their ultimate goal? What is the ultimate goal of the Holy Roman Church and all of her soldiers worldwide? To extirpate, root out, and destroy all those that will not adhere and bow down before their Pope and follow their doctrines and to rid the world of the pestilential Jew once and for all. That's their goal. Well, I'm here to tell you they may work hard at it. They may kill millions. They may blow up cities. They may set off biological devices. They may imprison and torture and kill Protestant, Bible-believing, Calvinist ministers. But he that sits in the la heavens shall laugh. He shall hold them. He shall have them in derision. 
Now, this has been the AB 1611 Hour, and I'm um, going to close out with some happy music. May the Lord Jesus Christ richly bless you. Until next time. And um, I would advise you that you can hear this broadcast tomorrow evening on 5050 at 9 p.m. There will be part two of the Bible Doctrine of Israel. And then you can hear this broadcast Monday evening, 5085, 6890, 7 p.m. May the Lord Jesus Christ richly bless you. Shalom.